Namaste and welcome to Inspiring Woman, produced by Today Youth Asia. Inspiring Woman is a television show which attempts to bring successful women and inspiring stories on women leadership from around the world. My name is Anjana and today we have the privilege of having with us four amazing women peacemakers who have lived their lives serving their countries for the better future. Ms. Mary Ann Arnado works with ceasefire and peacemakers in Mindanao. She coordinated the grassroots peace building and peace advocacy in Mindanao with the goal of promoting the participation of women in peace process between the government of Republic of Philippines and Moro Islamic Liberation Front. <laughs> Primarily, I am handling the, um, the ceasefire monitoring work at the grassroots level. So we are organizing volunteers, displaced communities, women and youth to come together, volunteer their services so that we are able to effectively monitor the ceasefire agreement between the Philippine government and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. So we are actually watching the implementation of the ceasefire to ensure that the rebels and the soldiers will implement what they have agreed. And so we are mobilizing young people especially for this purpose. And this is precisely done in order to create a conducive atmosphere for the negotiation in the official level. So we work and support the peace panels so that they are able to implement the ceasefire at the ground. We silence that we help silence the guns so that the contending parties will be able to talk effectively. Not really. I, as a child, I was just uh, like any uh, child who wants to play who wants to go around and have fun. But as I grow older, as I grow, as I become more mature, I was, uh, when I entered the university, I, that's when I, I had my own political, politicization. And at the time, we were dealing with the martial law of uh, the Marcos dictatorship. And so that's how I began, I got involved in peace building work. In, uh, we, at the time we were struggling, we were fighting against the dictatorship. Well, um, at the time we were in the middle of uh, uh, the all-out war, which was waged by the former president Estrada who was a, an action star. And so he won by popularity because of his uh, showbiz personality. And so when he entered the presidency, he thought it's the Mindanao situation is another action film, which uh, and he declared immediately an all-out war to wipe out the Bangsamoro people. He declared that he's going to pulverize the... Uh, the Bangsamoro, the Muslim population in Mindanao. And so that was a very scary situation for uh, having a, a kind of leader like that. And uh, at the time uh, the, um, the, of the all-out war, we had around, oh, uh, we have over a million people who were displaced. And um, at the time, the, the children who were staying in the evacuation centers could no longer um, uh, could no longer survive in the, the difficulties of uh, the, the evacuation. So people, uh, especially children, just die of uh, missiles and other preventable diseases like diarrhea. And so our group uh, worked together to convince the Philippine government to declare a ceasefire for humanitarian consideration for the sake of the children who are affected. And uh, at that time also we had uh, a complete travel ban to Mindanao, and our hotels were having zero occupancy. Uh, two of our, our our airport and our seaport were also bombed, and so we were the the, the whole place in, in total chaos. And our group uh, in the Mindanao People's Caucus, uh, Muslims, Christians, and indigenous peoples alike, we come together 
to uh, put a stop to this madness, and uh, we 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 cannot allow ourselves uh, to be to exploit the situation as a Muslim-Christian conflict, which is what they are trying to show. They were trying to polarize the situation between Muslims against Christians, and so we come together, uh, civil society, grassroots women from all religions, interfaith, so that we are able to immediately call for a ceasefire. And in that, uh, in that uh, campaign, we went around the uh, evacuation centers, we talked to the, to, the, to the IDPs, we conducted several focus dis group discussions so that we can ask people what can we do, what shall we do as, uh, as grassroots, as ordinary people, we do not have the command of the army and the rebels, but we are the ones suffering and affected by the conflict. And so based on our uh, discussions and focus group uh, meetings, the IDPs have uh, agreed that they will come out to the street. They will go out to the street and uh, conduct a peaceful demonstration which we call buckwheat power or the buckwheat means uh, this is our colonial uh, co colloquial term for um, for IDPs or this place and so uh, in this campaign uh, we bring together we everyone just came out of the evacuation centers and uh, protested demanded for a complete and uh, unconditional ceasefire uh, in Mindanao and it took some time for us to organize that others just also want to continue with the war there are Christians who are also who have also taken up arms because they are being used also by government and so uh, in the end, we, we, we all agreed that this is not the way to resolve the armed conflict. And for humanitarian reasons, we need to stop the conflict. And so we, we, during, uh, we campaigned for three days. We stood along the highways and uh, we, bore, we brought with us placards. We were standing silently but with a very strong message that we want a ceasefire. We want the fighting to stop. We want our children to go back to school. And there, for three days, we just stood. Thousands of uh, people gathered around the streets and silently protesting that uh, there should be a ceasefire. Now, we are very lucky that uh, I think on a, a week after that, uh, uh, no, the third day of the demonstration, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front declared a unilateral ceasefire in response to our call. And one week after that, the, the government also reciprocated by declaring also a ceasefire. And so for us, the ceasefire at this point is, uh, is something that we own. It is something that we have accomplished from our effort at the grassroots level. And the challenge right now is how to finally put a political settlement of the root causes of the armed conflict through the negotiation. Well, uh, I still consider myself as a youth. I don't know what is your uh, age bracket for the youth, but I come from the youth sector. I started with the youth movement. That's how I, I, I started my whole uh, political and peace-building work. And so even up to this point, I still feel that I'm part of the youth, but that's why I'm very. I'm also very supportive of the efforts of the youth leaders back in um, in my place because I see that I see that there they, there's a lot of things that they can do. There are th uh, especially now with the technology, especially with internet, uh, Facebook, Twitter, all this technology. You are all very lucky. During our time, we were just typing typing and li or, or using our pens to be able to communicate our message. Now, you have the internet. You can easily write, you can easily research, you can easily communicate with one another. You are in a far better position to introduce changes within your community. So I really challenge the youth to take this on further.
Ms. Srin Abdul Sarur is one of the founder of Manar Woman Development Federation in Sri Lanka. She assisted in the implementation of Sakti Gender Equality Program, which was sponsored by Canadian International Development Agencies, which aim to engage both government and non-government organizations in the development of gender-sensitive issues. <laughs> In 1990, uh, the Tamil Tigers evicted the entire uh, Muslim community from north part of Sri Lanka. Sri Lankan conflict is seen uh, as a conflict between the Sinhal and uh, Tamil conflict uh, that the Muslim minority has got caught to the whole process and we were the first group of people to pay for it. Uh, Actually, the whole eviction made me to think what it is to be a minority in my country, irrespective of the, um, you know, class or caste you come from. Uh, it is all about how minorities are oppressed uh, everywhere. Uh, my work started with that in order to make sure that the minority communities stand holding hand together strongly for their rights. So to date I work on connecting the Tamil and Muslim minority women together in order to demand for social justice in my country. No, I don't think right now the way the war ended in Sri Lanka, it, it is a military defeat and uh, the, uh, the post -war, in the post-war context, I'm not even calling it a post-conflict post country, uh, what happened was the Tamil Tigers were defeated and thereafter the government uh, effectively foreclosed any engagement uh, with the uh, community, especially minority communities. Uh, Particularly when uh, the Tamil Tiger leader was killed, the, the parliament, the first speech, our uh, president said there aren't, uh, he said there are two groups of people in my country. One is uh, the people who love the country, the other group who don't love the country. So the minorities don't love the country, so we are traitors. So it is uh, very important at the point of the defeat that the government should have engaged with the minority groups and give uh, a political solution to the minority community in Sri Lanka, that didn't happen. The whole area I work is so militarized, I feel that the discrimination and violence is not going to end at all in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, this was a program initiated by uh, uh, Canadian International Development Agency. Uh, I was uh, in charge of uh, women's economic empowerment um, and also uh, engaging uh, the government um, line ministries uh, to become part uh, of the whole gender mainstreaming process. Uh, I could say one of the achievements of uh, the Shakti project is bringing in Domestic Violence Act in Sri Lanka. We were able to prove to the government that domestic violence is no more a private issue. It is a public issue and we proved it to the government with the statistics and uh, with the greatest difficulty we passed the Domestic Violence Act which is enforced right uh, now in Sri Lanka and many women who have been abused by their husbands are, uh, have uh, now have the space to take up uh, cases against their husbands. Mm -hmm. As I previously said, uh, uh, my passion is about bringing the women together, particularly minority women. Uh, one of the things uh, we are doing through MANA uh, Women's Development Federation is irrespective of ethnicity, caste, uh, religious base, women come as a group of people to make change demand for social justice, justice. And in that process we look at women as a group of people who have been oppressed uh, uh, for a very long time in Sri Lanka. And my educational program teaches women their rights, uh, particularly women's rights as human rights and their right to ac uh, access to economic, social, and political uh, spaces. And that's how we bring the Muslim and Tamil women together to demand for their spaces, uh, various spaces, and particularly political spaces. Mm -hmm. 
Well, my passion is uh, working with young people. Uh, Nepal has a very young democracy. Uh, you guys out there, you uh, young people, have a whole new space to make the Nepal as a fully democratic developed country and uh, be bold. Um, have your dreams, um, you know, run wild, but make sure that you are uh, conscious about uh, what you want to do. Be persistent and uh, have patience. Uh, you will achieve whatever you like to do. Ms. Molly Mendoza is an independent humanitarian and peace advocate who has more than 20 years of experience in peace building and social development work including grassroots organizing in the Philippines. I first would like to explain that the Asian Disaster Response and Reduction Network is a, a coalition of many NGOs in Asia. Um, the countries include Afghanistan, Nepal, Pakistan, Indonesia, the Philippines, Cambodia, and so on and so forth. And a lot of these coalitions, both national and community-based, have programs for the youth and with the youth. So um, in many ways, uh, a lot of our members in the network are directly involved in youth programs because these are not just humanitarian programs, but also in areas of conflict. I was a vo humanitarian volunteer since 2007. Prior to that, I've had 25 years of peace and development engagement, both in government, civil society, and the communities. And right now, I deal with a lot of advocacies for um, upholding human dignity in, con in areas of conflict and also in many international regional forums. I try to raise the Asian people's voice in terms of development engagement for sustainable peace. So I think that opportunity to be able to relate to a lot of communities and also advocacy for policy change is very important in, in the work that I do. At the time when I had to shift to sociology, it was at the time of the transition from a martial law di dictatorship to democracy in my country. So if you have heard the People Power Nonviolent Revolution, I was part of it in 1996, and henceforth it was um, a lot of um, youth in my country. I was a youth then. My own sister became a, a community government leader um, in, in, in my village. And the youth voted for her, and for so many terms, she was able to serve the, the villages as a village chieftain. And um, that was very important for us. The youth needed inspiration. From a martial law dictatorship to democracy, um, we all wanted to do something good for our country. And I had had, I was given the opportunity to serve government under a new administration, uh, President Corazon Aquino, and subsequently with two other presidents. And um, to this day, I think uh, the the. The engagement of youth is, is of the youth is very important in so many ways. Um, I have not just been involved in in this aspect, but also in my school as a college student, as a student leader, also an editor in our school paper, current events, and also getting exposed to community work. <laughs> There are many ways, wherever we find ourselves as a youth, um, we, we can engage in school, um, current events, um, awareness raising, and also volunteering for non-youth, uh, for non-out-of-school um, youth, you know, um, for the people who have had no opportunities to go to school. We can do voluntary training programs for them. We can also engage in, in many social activities that will promote um, productive activities for them, um, because there are so many distractions now for the youth, no? and it is important that they have a specific focus and are able to do something productive for their community. Support also for scholarship programs so that we can continue to support a new breed of leaders for good governance. No? Oh, I'm very
very humble if people would aspire to be like me, but it is important that we continue to uphold what is good in our tradition, what is good in our family values, in our social values, um, of especially compassion, honesty, simplicity, and humility. I think these, these values have to be um, inculcated in the work that we do and so that we can also influence our peers. And in the future, if we are given the opportunity to take over um, certain um, offices of governance or even for civil society work, we can be respected as credible um, leaders. Dr. D. Aker is the Deputy Director of John B. Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice, which manages the Women Peacemakers Program. She has visited many countries throughout Asia, Central America, and Africa for the same. <laughs> The Women Peacemaker Program was initiated with the realization that women around the world are doing amazing work on the ground. And we found a donor who was willing to support us so that we could begin to document, we could bring the women in, document their stories, film them, and then share them again with the world, which is where we are now in the project. I was very fortunate. Much of the early 1990s, I was going back and forth to Uganda and working with women there, and they were very instrumental at that time in creating a group of people in, uh, around the country who were aware of the importance of writing a constitution. They, like Nepal at the time, were going through a constitutional creation process, and the women were the ones who went out and taught all the people, the difference between federalism and republic and all the words that are complicated when you've been sort of a tribalistic society. And it was a very important time when people began to talk about Uganda. They'd say, I'm a Ugandan instead of I'm a Luo, I'm a whatever. They, they really identified with their country. And watching how the women made that happen for them was very, very important because they came up with a very good constitution. It's got some leadership problems, but the constitution is an excellent constitution. That was a very special time. I'd had a long series of television programs, and at the end of that series, I started writing a column called Human Terms. And I was lucky enough to go to countries, for example, like Turkey. And Turkey at that time, when I went there to tell the story, happened to have a woman prime minister the first in an Islamic situation. And uh, Tenzu Chilev was her name, and she was really quite open and surprising. And I got a chance as a journalist to go and interview people on the street. What's this like, you know? We, they were totally shocked. They were totally unprepared, first of all, that a woman could take that position, but also the idea that they could in the future, they thought at the time, you know, be much more engaged and again in the political process and to take a role. And so I had a chance to interview a lot of young people and people just literally sitting on the sides of the road. So as a journalist, I got a sense of the importance of the grassroots awareness of what's going on in their world. And I could share that in my column. <laughs> Joan B. Kroc was a woman uh, who was a philanthropist. Um, she was a widow of a very rich gentleman, the, the McDonald Hamburgers Corporation. And she actually gave the money to the University of San Diego to create the Institute for Peace and Justice. And the idea of the Institute is that we will not only work with uh, peace building and working with negotiations with top leaders or whoever needs to be brought to the table, but we'll also do the justice work, the human rights work that means that civil society has to be brought into the process. The people who are victimized so often are not otherwise heard. So that's the point of the Institute. And we have many projects, Women Peacemakers being one of them. Another one is Nepal Peace Initiative. I've been coming here now for 10 years. And it's been my privilege to meet with people um, from all levels of society and share some ideas about negotiation and how you do it or other areas that might be important uh, in democratic processes. And for the future, 
Um, we're, I hope to continue. Uh, I'm, of course, uh, getting other people who are engaged here in Nepal. Um, we don't keep an office on the ground. We live in San Diego. Everybody we work with are local Nepalis. There's their job. It's your job to decide what you want to do. We just provide some tools. We'll continue to do that. We're expanding the Women Peacemakers program, so we have a regional network here in Asia and other continents where we have other women peacemakers. We work in Guatemala. We work in teaching law to um, and documentation of uh, cases of, of civil rights abuse in Western Africa. So there's a lot of different things going on. I actually aspire to become like you. <laughs> I think that uh, the youth of Nepal, the youth of the world, I mean, I've seen it more and more. And one of the things I'm most inspired about is what you're already doing. I mean, certainly today's Youth Asia is really... Um, like this beacon. I mean, people will tell you that I talk about you all all the time. I admire you. We just had a big youth program in San Diego, and we had 700 youth from Mexico and the United States. And we actually had a film of one of the young people here uh, speaking there to that audience so they could learn about what you're doing. But it's also the young people there and everywhere that have to make this change and this transition. And it can't just be anger at everything. It's got to be how do you solve it? What do you do with it? And you're coming up with the best answers, and I thank you for that. Continue it. With this, we have come to the end of today's show. Thank you very much to our four amazing women peacemakers for being with us today and sharing your insightful thoughts and ideas. We look forward to your feedback. Our email address is utya at the red gmail dot com. Thank you for being with us. We will see you next week at the same time. Have a great week. Namaste.